back on the Zero Hour. I'm your host, Richard R.J. Escal. As you know, we consider uh, labor reporting one of the most important functions of journalism. And as you also have probably observed, virtually no major American publication has a labor section. In fact, very few have even a single labor journalist. What newspapers have instead is what they call business sections as if somehow bosses were more important than workers but as i always say bosses are not job creators workers are boss creators which is a you know, way of going about work we can organize and change someday but in the meantime and uh, even after that labor journalism is a venerated and important profession that's why i always appreciate talking to my next guest who's a regular on the program he is a senior labor reporter as well as the founder of payday report which i encourage you to read and follow if you do not mike elk uh joins us now and mike first of all welcome to the program and second i believe the website is paydayreport.com is that right yeah, we're paydayreport.com. We're an Emmy-nominated publication based here in my hometown of Pittsburgh. Uh, we do work in Brazil as well, and we do work in West Virginia. Uh, we have several affiliate bureaus where we partner with other publications. And we don't have capacity. It's part of a solidarity economics approach. Um, and, you know, if you look at what's happening right now, uh, particularly in the field, you know, the media is under attack right now. And the only way we can, yeah. yeah, I mean, we're, we're under attack right now. I mean, if you look at the strike happening in Hollywood right now, not just in Hollywood, but in Atlanta and North Carolina and New York, you have 11,000 TV writers across the nation striking. And on a lot of sets, you know, writers are working there every day, right? Uh, and I think too often in American society, we dehumanize what writers do. We think anyone can do it because people can write. But to write quickly and to write on demand is a very special skill. It's a craft. Uh, and part of the reason I don't call myself even an editor at Payday Report is that they're, they're just, it's a very hard thing. And, and, you know, I'm just now learning the editing craft. Uh, I've always referred to myself as a, you know, uh, senior labor reporter as a kind of a player coach uh, on the squad here. Uh, you know, I'm a baseball guy and it's, it's very much that kind of approach, uh, that we take. Uh, and so I think that's in some response, you know, look, I'm 37, right? Uh, I've been laid off. I've laid off at In These Times magazine twice. I was laid off at CAF working in various projects, right? Uh, the media economy, particularly in the left press, is one of precarity, uh, and we all know that. Uh, and and that is now becoming the norm. And with the movement to chat GI, because p part of the issue you have now, I think, with the rise of the Internet, that's different than when, Richard, you, you and I started, right, in media, right? Um, right. And, and, and it's actually very different than you. You and I have very different career approaches to media, right? Uh, this is all I've ever done, right? Uh, uh, and, you know, I come from a pretty poor working class family. So if, if you're single, right, and you're disabled like I am, I'm autistic and I'm actually struggling with long COVID, which is why I'm in bed. So I appreciate you guys letting me talk in my pajamas. These are nice pajamas. I bought them with a donation from our readers. Um, and, you know, I've been spending a lot of time in bed uh, because, you know, with, with um, COVID and with also being a dengue survivor, I have all kind of neurological issues, um, which, which are really hard. Um and so, you know, what's great, though, about having a publication and having readers that fund it is that it gives you security to go out and freelance because right now there's not enough freelance market, uh, even compared to 10 years ago, right? You know, we're being offered half the rates that I was being offered when I, when we first met Richard nearly 15 years ago when I was, you know, 23, right? Uh, and so unless we have sort of platforms and ways that we can share resources and help one another in the media system, we're not going to overcome this because, look, these capitalists, these rich people, you can never trust them to fund the media, and you never will. Um, and, 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 and I certainly don't, which is why we've sort of shied away from big donors, and we've sort of remained with folks who say, hey, you know, we want to go out and cover this strike, because all too often now, even if you look at what they're teaching in journalism schools, they're teaching this very elitist kind of financial market Bloomberg style. Uh, they're not really quoting workers anymore. It's very problematic. Right. And, and, and part of that is about the diminishing quality. And now with chat GBT, we're going to see financial reporting. We're going to see press conference reporting. We're going to see crime wave reporting, uh, basically reading off of social media forms of various government entities. So we're going to see even more of a collapsing, even more of the ability to manufacture dissent, right? 
Uh, you, right, you know, or consent. Yeah, no, a- absolutely. Manufacturer consent. Sorry. Yeah, yeah I, I I agree with everything you said, Mike. Emphatically. I mean, there was a day. You know, I spent uh, years away from journalism, but when I started out. You could, I mean, that was mostly an alternative press where, you know, it wasn't about the money, but there was always the option to work as a professional journalist. You could freelance and do yeah. magazine features. And especially, make, especially if you're a good photographer, of, you could go, you could go, you know, photograph some weddings on the weekends, right? Yeah. Now they pay, right. And now they pay, you know, pennies and they're trying to drive you, you either You either have to have generational wealth or... You have to you have to have a spouse who's wealthy, right? So if you're someone right. like me who's autistic and disabled and lives alone and has lived alone almost all of my adult life, right? Which isn't uncommon for a lot of autistic men. Um, you know, if you're someone like me, it's it's much harder, right? Um, you know, I don't have family wealth to fall back on. Uh, you know, my parents, my father. Uh, you know, I made more money than my father did in his career, right? I come from a very working class background, union family, right? And so we push out those kind of voices and we push it towards the people who either have family that is wealthy or a partner that is wealthy, right? And we and we take away opportunities, right? And it can become very difficult, right? Oh, absolutely. Look, I, I don't have family wealth either. And, uh, you know, when I was married and had kids, I had to leave journalism because there were, uh, and also music, which is my other you know, a passion, but I had to leave them because, you know, it was difficult then. Now it's impossible and, um, or very difficult uh, in the ecosystem that they've built. And that's what the writer's striker, uh, writer's yeah. guild strike is about now is even the ecosystem that they've built. Uh, my brother's a screenwriter, you know, has been very, has been successful at it. Uh, and, you know, that his world has changed. And, uh, you know, you can't make the kind of, you know, people say, well, he made so much money selling this script. I'm not talking about my brother, but people in general, they don't realize the years of hustle between scripts and everything. So it averages out in most cases to a middle class income. And uh, or, or people do it to... as a side gig. I mean, I mean, a lot of what right. we're seeing with TV writing is they're going after people that are laid off professors. Uh, now with right. chat gbt you can you know you can plagiarize stuff you can plagiarize and, game shows I and mean, now they're taking think about all the people that wrote bowser jokes to go on family feud and those kind of things right you used to have people that had to write those prompts right uh and now um i think and now we're also seeing sort of a rise of these kind of uh bloggers and and twitch streamers uh, that aren't using very good quality at all material uh, and really driving down, I think, sort of interest, right? So we're seeing a, a crisis of the commons in many ways, right? Right, absolutely. Which, which, which is that we have a completely imbalanced labor market in the journalism world, right? And it's both driving down quality and it's driving down costs. So, you know, when I see the Writers Guild strike, I really think that's a strike that represents me, uh, that represents where I'm at, you know, and, I, and I'm a small business owner. But that's the way that those big jobs used to work. It used to almost be like a hiring hall, right? Uh, freelance right. work, right? Uh, you know, I'm like a general contractor. Sometimes if we get a big project, I'll hire a couple people, right? And we keep an editor, you know, on payroll here who helps us. Uh, and we use a couple different folks, right? And so we have a, a lot of opportunities. And we try to partner with publications that similarly have uh, low budgets, right? Right, and, and and that devote a lot of their, you know, the bulk of their budget to the, the people producing the work, right? You know, I mean, to me, that's why this writer's strike is so important because there's a difference between being, a, you know, I like your analogy of a contractor uh, and, you know, because you can make a living at it, um, but now... And that's been eroded and eroded and eroded over time. And now they're trying to turn, uh, I, I like the phrase, they're sort of Uberizing the writing profession so that you're only paid for gig work. Uh, you can't make a living at it. And I think their reasoning or cynical reasoning is, well, there's always somebody who wants to see their name in print. So, 
Uh, it doesn't matter. They don't care about the quality anymore. Frankly, I think there's a whole class of journalists. Now, the ones who do get major media jobs don't really care that much about accuracy either so much as they do about pleasing their bosses. So I, I think there's a convergence of crises that makes the Writers Guild strike super important and makes restoring the, you know, ethos of journalism that says, get it right, get it fast, talk about the people that are affected by it, you know, talk about how it connects with the lives of your readers. Oh, did we lose Mike? Okay, Mike's coming back. All right. Uh, all right. Well, Mike, you back? Yeah. So I think, you know, we have, we have a crisis of the commons, right? And I think, you know, Boots Riley brings us up when we were both starting in the blogosphere, right? You had this rapidly exploding blogosphere, right? Uh, and that's when I first started reading you, uh, during the war in Iraq, during the healthcare debate days, when you had a huge struggle within the democratic party, right? And we had left journalists that were really independent. And, and that's something I've always admired about you. I mean, you, you're always someone who will tell the truth no matter how hard it is. And, and, and that's one of the things I've always admired about your courage in speaking about your own recovery uh, with substance abuse issues, uh, which is that the truth is often a very complex thing, right? And that often we even have fallacies in how we see the truth, right? And so now what we're having is we're not having people present those questions of telling the truth anymore, right? We're having people present this very narrated, this very almost like AI driven, right? Cheap form of article that has really driven down the standard of what people do, right? Uh, and if you and if you look at most of these corporate media sites right now, they're they're really crap, right? Because part of what they do is they're just so loaded up with ads, right? We we don't we don't have any ads, right? Um, you know, we, right. we might link out to our partners with Brazil do Fato, which is a Brazilian publication, or we might link out to, to We Yeah, right? But we just don't operate on an ad model, right? Because our message is our message. And, and you know, you know, we were watching, and, and maybe we could talk about it some more, but Harry Belfonte. And right. I could really relate to the precarity that Belfonte felt in his career, you know, having shows canceled and things like that. And if you look at TV writers in this country... I know that might sound like an elitist profession. And, you know, there is a certain part of the left that sees the media as the enemy of the working class, right? I've heard, I've heard Jonathan Kazam, who's the communications director of UE, say that. And that's completely asinine. It goes against what we stand for as Americans, which is freedom of the press. Right. Freedom of the press does just not mean that you don't intrude. Freedom of the press needs to be interpreted the way it is in, in places like England and France and Italy, where you have massively funded public sectors. That is the only way, you know, I was debating with Summer Lee, the congresswoman, you know, I went to high school with. Um, and, you know, the left so often will use the media as a punching bag, but they present no, you know, real way of how do, how do we save the media, right? And so I think this strike right now is, at, is highlighting to people, because Writers Guild, you know, a lot of people who write in the Writers Guild unions will come back and then write as a journalist, right? And right. And becoming... It's becoming bit work, whereas it didn't used to be that way. You know, your average network TV show used to be 22 seasons, 22 episodes per season. And then you used to have made-for-TV movies. Made-for-TV movies have all but disappeared, right? These were low-budget, often the depictions of historical events for special occasions. And, and some of those low-budget, I mean, you've seen some of those made-for-TV movies. Some of them are great. I think Killing Field, which was a made-for-PBS movie about how racial division was used to crush Meat packer worker organizing in Chicago is, is one of the best, right? One of my favorite movies. Um, and so I think, you know, we're really at a point where we have to really start imagining something. And I think activists on the left have to do a self-examination. And I think they have to think about no longer beating up or playing this game we so often see on social media where you see some poor reporter who's working their tail off and everybody beats up on them. Right. 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 And, no, and, I, and, I, and, I and, 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 you know, you, you, you see that all the time. I mean, in reporting, especially when you're reporting stuff, I mean, you've seen that in your own career. I mean, you've certainly told complex, hard truths, you know, I mean, you're an honest broker. And you run up against a kind of tribalism on the left as well as the right that depending on how you defend the, define the left right but certainly in terms of the 
political parties that if you have a truth to tell that offends one party, it's, you know, partisans will come after you when really, if we really want a people's movement to change things, it should be about finding out the truth, telling the truth, and then people can decide how to change it. But if, it, if you're going to come from the place of, no, I'm for party A versus party B, and, and no matter what, and if that means suppressing the truth, I'll suppress the truth, that's not a people's movement. That's just a game between elites, and you're just a pawn in a game between elites. That's my opinion, you know, and that's gotten me in trouble. So, you know, I mean... Oh, well, yeah, I mean, I mean and, and, you know, it's, it's hard because... You know, look, we did some reporting on the Amazon labor union not being run very undemocratically. We were the first place to do it. And then what we've often seen, what happens when you work in sort of the smaller left publications is, I sort of used to joke, we're like the PT boats of the Navy of the media. Right. You know, we're these small, nimble crafts. You know, maybe we can take out the destroyer if we aim it in the right direction and get lucky, right? And, and, the, and the ship doesn't explode while you're aiming the torpedo, Right. Because we've seen that with media outlets. I mean, how many media outlets have we worked at where you're working regularly and then boom, they just don't have budget anymore, right? Right, right, sure, yeah. I mean, I, and, and you know, and I, I don't want to call any of these owners out because I know the margins they're working, right? Uh, but some people, you know, and, and the people that do deserve to get called out as Jacobin, you know, I've been to newsstands in Brazil and you can see Jacobin high gloss on newsstands in Brazil, right? Uh, and, and, uh -huh. and, you know, they were up to a few years ago not paying the writers one hundred twenty-five dollars an hour. Now, now they've increased that. You mean one hundred twenty-five dollars um, an article, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, which is nothing. Yeah. Which is, you right, know, when I course. was starting yeah. at the Nation, when I was twenty-two, I was making three fifty a story, which was bad. But if you could write two or three a week, and you were a kid my age, and you were living with roommates and paying five hundred dollars a month in rent, and you could eat food and go to house party, you know what I mean? I remember when there were places that would pay you, you know, a thousand, fifteen hundred. You know, oh, there were places where you wrote a long reported story and it was thousands of dollars. It might take you weeks and weeks, but you could do it because there would be thousands of dollars yeah. at the end of it. All of that is gone now. And then the other side of it, Mike, that I experience, and, and it's, and it's, it's Chop Shop. What, what was the other it's side? It's Chop Shop, and, and the, you know, the editors were like, yeah, it's an important story, but I'm not sure it'll get the eyeballs, you know? And I, I relate yeah. to the, their situation if they need the traffic. We, 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 when we were in Brazil, we had that. And, and I think you know, a disturbing thing, I think, right now, in the left press, is how it's really turned away from the Ukraine debate. I mean, outside yeah. of Medea Benjamin and Lula, there's not any big mainstream American voices out there. And, and just, you know, look, Putin's a terrible person. Uh, but look, I have, I'm, my, my grandfather's cousins were killed in a ditch in Barbiara for being Jewish. You know, we're giving guns to some of these Nazis over there and some of these battalions that have been merged into these militias that have been merged into the Ukrainian army, right? Um, and, we, you know, we did that with the Mujahideen. And look how that worked, right? right so at a certain course. point, we have yeah. to de-escalate. We have to negotiate, right? Uh, the borders have been maintained. It's, a, it's essentially a stalemate. And Lula's trying to lead a coalition. You know, the president of Brazil is trying to lead a coalition to do this, and he's really pressured. But you don't see any coverage really in the left press of Lula at all. Well, the reason, you no, know, you're absolutely right. And the reason for and that. This is the fourth largest democracy in the world, right? And, and the reason for that is, I mean, is, is many fold, but, but uh, I, there is no area where I get more flack than when I cover Ukraine, as I'm going to do in this week's show, too, because. It's because it's a perfect example of something that's become partisan where uh well if you're doubtful on ukraine then you're doubtful on democratic party leadership then you're an enemy and i can't tell you how many times i've been called uh, even though i hate putin i make it clear that you know this is a war crime to invade uh, ukraine uh, my own grandparents fled what is now the uh, ukraine uh, uh because as jews they were subjected to yeah. horrific violence their village was destroyed and so on and yet, when I talk, I'm, I qualify for Ukrainian citizenship, by the way, but, oh. because of my grandparents. But uh, 
when I talk about it, I'm Putin's puppet. I'm a this, yeah. that. But but to I'm, me, I mean, I mean, I had somebody who was a supposed leftist tell me I was sounding like Steve Bannon. You know, look, I was nominated for an Emmy for my work. You know, rushing into a active shooter situation under heavy gunfire. You know, we lost family, friends, uh, people we had friends in common with at Tree of Life synagogue massacre. You know, that congregation there, Tree of Life. Uh, when I was having health issues, gave gave us quite a bit of money. Um, oh, really? for a number of years, uh-huh. yeah, to 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 deal with the COVID issues, right? Um, you know, their their assistance fund, the Jewish assistance fund. Uh, so th- that is a part of my life. Um, and I think you know so often, and somebody said this to me who wasn't even Jewish. Uh, you know, we don't let Jews just speak for themselves, right? I think there's almost this fear of you know, Zionism, right? And particularly the far right Zionism, because there's many different forms of Zionism, right? Sure. I mean, there's some Zionists that say what they did in Pittsburgh, that you should just go to a desert neighborhood in Pittsburgh and take that over. That's Zionism too, right? So there's many different forms of Zionism, right? Uh, and I think the Zionists have been painted so badly in, in Israel. And for some of it is because they have committed massive atrocities, right? I mean, in some ways, they, they took the trauma they endured and then they inflicted it on others. Uh, they continued a cycle of abuse, right? They were traumatized. And, and part of it is that, you know, when they were escaping Europe, uh, the immigration policies were so restrictive, they had nowhere else to go. So they went right. there and they, and they killed a bunch of people and they treated them subhuman. Uh, and after 48, it really went downhill. And it's complex, right? Because you had two communities that were living together, right? You, you, you know, it, it is complex, but... It's so right wing the discussion, and there was so much um, right wing Republican money that was poured into it from right wing Jews, who you know I always hear people say, "Oh, well, Jews are so conservative, right?" Well, we look at the statistics, right? Eighty percent of Jews voted for Biden, right? Right. This is right. a very extreme fringe wealthy position of Jews under Jews under yeah. thirty in particular in this country very supportive of the Palestinian. Right. And the Look, squirrel, squirrel Hill, where, the, where, where, where the tree of life synagogue massacre happened. The guy who was ahead of that, uh, Steve Irwin was ahead of the ADL American defamation league. And he lost by, um, you know, uh, a, a little over a thousand votes to summer Lee, a black woman who was pro BDS, which is the ability to boycott disinvestment and sanction. Right. 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 Which is by the way, another area where free speech is being trampled because whether you agree with, you know, and BDS can be boycotting products in the, in the illegal settlements from the illegal settlements or from Israel as a whole, which is exactly what was done with South Africa yeah. to end apartheid. But yeah. whether you support that or not, the fact is increasing laws are being passed to make it illegal, speech illegal, speech that advocates. Well, I, was, I was just reading something that there was a guy, it was either in like Arkansas, Louisiana. He spoke at a university. He was pro BDS. And under the state law, he wasn't going to get paid the five hundred dollars he gave for that speech. Yeah, well, that's, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, think think about that. Journalists that, should if, be if, supporting. If you engage in political yeah. speech, you can't get paid for your work. If they don't think like the political speech, you do. If they like, yeah. if your message is their message, they'll they'll happily pay you. But if you change, and, 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 and every what, journalist in America, Mike, I, every journalist in America. Should at every mainstream publication, at every minor publication, should be saying it's wrong to censor speech. Every journalist in America should be challenging the prosecution of Julian Assange. Every journalist yeah. in America should be saying, "Why did the the federal well, I, government?" I wouldn't would say questioning; I would say raising questions about it. Because uh, I, well, I that do, is I, questioning. I, I, questioning I, I, is raising questions. You know. Yeah. No. Uh, no. I, I mean, because I, I I do think he he I think he absolutely needs to go on trial for it. Uh, I've covered these kind of things, these kind of cases, uh, and I think I think it's important uh, that there be a trial, that it be fair, and that we resolve it that way. Uh, and and I think I think there are some issues there because sexual assault is important. Well, but uh, I'm but, not talking but, about but, sexual assault. I'm talking about. Well, first of all, by the way, those charges well, that's, dropped. But uh, no, but, no, no. I I I know that. I know that. Yeah. But but it, but it's complicated because it's occurred in different countries. Well, so, he should. There, there's no reason he to prosecute him here I mean, for anything. He's an Australian citizen. Whatever he did was done outside this country. Yes, yes. But New York but Times. A, there's, there's, oh, wait, there's, wait a minute, Mike. There, there's a big disagreement among. There's a big disagreement, and I'm saying this as someone who's covered a lot of sexual misconduct. 
there's a big disagreement about this. Uh, and I do think that if a court somewhere found enough evidence about him, uh, that he shouldn't ride out on some technicality, that he should face trial. But he uh, hasn't. Because, because I, I, Fine, I, I, look, but they I haven't. Work, I work. I, yes. They and haven't, they, Mike. They, see, to me, what I think happened, and, and there's evidence. No, and I agree. See, I agree. I agree. But they didn't like saying. his message, and the most effective way to take him down was to create a sexual assault. No, 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 I no, 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 no. But, 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 but here, here, but, here's what I'm saying. I think the left misplayed it. That, that's sort of why I'm challenging him the phrase. Yeah. Is I think the left misplayed it. You know, when Michael Moore came out and he called them honeypots, right? These two women. Oh, that's horrible. No, I don't support that either. And, and, and then there, 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 was a real, there was a real for... massage. There was a real misogynistic dismissing of it. And, yeah, and, and our, I, our, our, our job as reporters isn't to weigh in. Our job is to present a complex story. Right. Right. And, and, and I, I think because the, 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 that, that way is credible. And this is something, you know, Bill Greider taught me about presenting evidence. Right. Right. Is, and different perspectives is your job as a reporter is to provoke a debate and a dialogue. You know? Yeah, no, I agree with you. And, you know, I've looked into the, that sexual assault case carefully. I think there, you know, it seemed to me looking at the evidence that there was evidence of misconduct there on his part, for sure. And I think that the women who initially reported, well, they didn't, then they did, then they did, but that's okay. That's common in sexual assault cases. That's to be accepted as part of the trauma of being victimized by sexual assault. But in the end, the only legal, and, and by the way, there was pressure on the prosecutor and all this, it became politicized, um, which is also part of the body of evidence. In the end, the jurisdiction, uh, you know, responsible, yeah. drop the charges. And you and I as reporters have to say, okay, that's, you know, we can investigate it if we want to. No, 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 But what I'm saying is I don't, I don't think, you know, I, I think we had a miscommunication and sometimes that, that happens, right? But I, I think, you know, what, 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 certainly he shouldn't be prosecuting for publishing what he did, right? Right, that's my because point. Because, you, you that's know, my and, point. and, and, and yeah. so I think, you know, let's just make sure we clarify because there is still some dispute over whether or not he should be tried for this, right? Yeah, and I have no, you know, position on that. I, I just think that every journalist. Oh well, I, I think, I think, Assange I think if, if if if, if a country came back because guys that do this do this repeatedly and they often get out of it, and if a country came back with a subpoena, we absolutely should extradite them. That is different than being prosecuted for that, and so I think the idea. Well, uh, I'm sort it, of claiming, I'm claiming, I'm claiming that hey, you know, this was a, a defense plot. It might be true, but we just don't know conclusively, and we we haven't known conclusively. It, it, right? If he, if there was a, a legitimate crime committed in the United States, that's the reason. To, that would be the only reason to bring him here. But journalism is not a crime, and that's my point. Yeah, and I agree. Yeah, you know, and this business about characterizing him. As and Wikipedia as, a, but, but I think I think I think it's important that we have extradition treaties for other places where crimes may have been committed. You know, because I think there was just such a rally around. You know, like that sort of tribalism of like, oh, you know, these women are honeypots. They're slut. You know. Oh, I, I, that's grotesque language. That's. I, but, but you but you heard it being said by. I, I mean, Michael Moore, said, the filmmaker, said it. I also I also heard people assuming he was guilty before the evidence was out, but that but my real concern is not that I'm dismissing you know anybody's experience of sexual assault. I've experienced sexual assault. I, I don't dismiss yeah. it, but but what I'm saying is if we're journalists, you know his work was good enough that the New York Times published it, right? That uh, Guardian published it, and yet everybody's you know. We need to, as a, 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 we need solidarity among journalists, and that solidarity has got to include, you know, yeah, if a guy robs a bank, if a guy commits sexual assault, if he commits murder, or anybody does, that, of course, they should be tried. But you don't try somebody for journalism because journalism is not a crime, and and even the journalist class, the privileged elite of the journalist class, which is small but powerful has decided to throw him overboard, whether it's to sweeten their beats. Oh, or, I agree, I agree, you know, I agree. Whatever, but, 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 you know. but that's that, that's what I'm saying about stories being complex, right? Right. Because, well, let's be honest, the guy kind of is narcissistic. I wouldn't f 
invite him over to my barbecue. Yeah, but so what? You know, it, it, no, it, I, I get that. I a get lot that of good little. journalists, uh, you and I are not normal, Mike. A lot of good journalists <laughs> aren't normal people because if you're normal, you don't go into this line of work. Well, so, well, well here, here's, here's all I'm going to say on Assange, and I don't want to move on to something else. Uh, yeah, okay, fine. Is, is I wouldn't invite Assange to go to a Pittsburgh Pirates ball game with me. I mean, I I'd, probably, I'd publish his journalism, but but I, but I, you know, he doesn't seem like the kind of guy who would be able to shut up enough during a ball game to watch a good ball game. You know, I might not invite Cy Hirsch either, but um, <laughs> you don't think Cy Hirsch would be all right at a ball game? He like, might be fun, actually. Well, I mean, might what, 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 what if be. it was a blowout? Right? If it was a blowout, would Cy might. Hirsch be good? Like, say, 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 like, say, okay, say in this situation, because you know the Nats, there, it doesn't really seem like Yins have a team and. Who, who 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 is your team being from Utica? Uh, living in LA and DC. I you know I I would piss off my son-in-law too much if I, if I said who my team was. Oh, come on, come here. on. Um, look, come on. So, come on. Uh, what, 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 really, you're uh, what? Are you you're gonna you're not going to take the gloves off. Come on. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, okay, Yankees. Well, I mean that's fine. You know, there's so many different types. I mean, of I know Yankees they're fans. you know, I know they have the corporate rap but you know yeah but they're also you know the new york team right and they're also the world team and they're also you know a team that represents particularly some of the most heavily latino immigrant parts of the country too so you know yeah, I, no, that's Trump, exactly Trump, it. and you know there's like 20 different types but the people that go to the games are awful jerks who you know will chant really racist stuff like they chant at jackie robinson at tim anderson they chant at uber and an Uber driver, a guy who's a minor leaguer because he wasn't making enough money and he was poor. He was working as an Uber driver and he bragged. He had a 4.9 star rating, which is pretty good. I mean, that shows some precision as a pitcher. So that's relevant. I mean, I, I just have sentimental memories of buying weed <laughs> behind outside Yankee Stadium or Yankee <laughs> Bones, as they were called. Um, so well, well, I mean, I mean, that's, that's the thing people forget. It's from your generation. I mean, you're my dad's generation. Baseball was the hippie sport. Unlike football, which was seen as militaristic, you know, right. and baseball well, was much more pop. Baseball was seen as a calm, cool, relaxed. You could smoke a joint and have a beer or two and, and kind of doze I, off in between innings, you know, and talk a little bit. I remember going on a, a peace march in 1969 in Bryant Park. I was 15, and uh, we were, everybody was marching and saying, you know, hey, hey, LBJ, how many kids did you do today? My friend Robbie and I started saying, the Mets will take it in five. The Mets will take it in five. <laughs> and pretty soon the whole crowd was shouting, the Mets will take it in five. That was, you know. That was baseball for us. I remember when Shea Stadium was open. That was a little. So, so, so if, if yeah. you if you if you could go to a baseball game with anybody, like any journalist living, who who, oh, you, who do you want to go? You, with? you. No, 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 no. Uh, uh, excluding uh, present uh, company. Yeah, that, that's that's like saying you want to like alive to, or like, dead. Like, it's like it's like telling your only sister that you're your favorite sister, right? Right. Uh, right. <laughs> right. I don't you know. know. That's, that's too tough. A, Jimmy Breslin. Oh, Jimmy, Jimmy, you know, Brett, he'd be a blast, be man. Yeah, he'd have been a blast. Be a blast. Yeah. I, re I read that book he wrote about the Mets and how it was represented in the Striver class in the 60s when they became a franchise and they lost, you know, like 120 games, right? So I read yeah. that book. It was 100 pages. And then I dated uh, a woman who was a New Yorker who it was a long distance relationship and she really wanted me to move to New York and she was a native New Yorker. And look, you know, I'm from Pittsburgh, right? And I and I, I just couldn't deal. This was many years ago. I, I just couldn't deal, and we're friends since then. I just couldn't deal with the long commute. You know, yeah. Uh, I, no, I, it's I, tough. You know, Pitt, Pittsburgh. You never drive more than like fifteen minutes to get somewhere. We're very right. provincial. There's all these hills. There's all these rivers. People don't cross the rivers enough. It's a problem we have. Uh, but to spend that kind of time commuting uh, in a place like that. And, and with all that kind of wealth and money, I mean, and she was very financially independent, so it wouldn't have been an issue. And she was working in a pretty ethical profession, you know, solar panels. Um, and, and I and I just couldn't, uh, I I couldn't do it. But I would go up there, and she would bribe me with Mets tickets. So I, secretly, when the Pirates are bad, I root for the Mets. So yeah, I get that. No, I get that. And by the way, the other journalist probably be good at a ball game is aj liebling you ever read aj liebling yeah. so, you know you know you know you know who i would want to go to a ball game with who 
I think Juan Gonzalez. Not a bad choice. I think I think you know he's done a lot of baseball reporting. He's Amy Goodman's co-host. Right, I know. Yeah, he, yeah. he would he would have. You know, you want to talk about a Yankees fan, right? He's a Puerto Rican from New York. He's he's a big Yankees fan. He's a big anti-imperialist, right? So I'm willing to accept, and and I and maybe this is something that I'm, I'm glad you could come forward about being a Yankees fan. You know, I'm probably. Your decades of recovery made it easier to talk about, <laughs> now, right? I, now the I, mean, I, mean, that... I mean, how much? How much did that did that help you? You know, you, you said, but I, yes, you're right. I have. I, a I mean, I'm myself. proud of you. I mean, I mean, yeah, this is, this is big. <laughs> yeah, my name is Richard E, and I'm a Yankees fan. The, yeah. uh, I, you know, by the way, you know, I know people who like this Yankees Mets hostility is huge, but also my wife is from the Bronx, so it's kind of like. You know, if I weren't, you know, it would be a problem. But I, I love the Mets too. I don't feel this rivalry, but a lot of people do. So, well, you know, and 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 the thing also about the Mets, I love. Uh, and I, I knew a Mexican baseball writer. Who I used to go up there and visit sometimes, uh, and we would go out in Corona, which the neighborhood around there is like one of the best Mexican is like the biggest Mexican neighborhood in New York, right? And the most authentic Mexican food, right? So you take the subway out there, and then you go out to Corona, and go to Flushing, which is like huge Chinese immigrants, right? Amazing food, right? So I really enjoyed it, and and a lot of the train rides above ground. Um, I've strangely yeah, never great. been. I, I love that I've, too. Yeah. I've, I've strangely never been to Yankee Stadium, so maybe maybe we'll get to go someday. Yeah, that'd be uh, awesome. I want to I want yeah. to apologize to all the Yankees fans. Listening, I know your people too. Um. <laughs> All right. Well, we thank you. But uh, listen, we're going to have to you, go. You are loved. But, you, you are worthy of loving. Yankees particularly fans. since you mentioned the <laughs> right, right. Since you mentioned those Mexican restaurants, I, I forgot to eat today. So now I'm hungry. So I got to go eat. And we're out of out of time. But uh, always great to talk to you. Keep yeah, it always good to talk to you. Keep us posted on the writer's strike. And, and so, uh, sorry to be so tired. You know, I have long COVID, so I'm in bed. Listen, but, um, I'm just I'm just getting over COVID, rebound COVID, and pneumonia. So I've been pretty knocked out, too. So I relate. Well, well, maybe maybe that's what we could do is when we go to the ball game, we could get, like, disabled seating together. Yeah, you yeah, know? yeah. You know, I mean, you're, you're old enough to be my dad. So, you know, but so maybe that's, you know, giving you an idea. Yeah, how much the, how how bad this disease is? You know, seven percent of Americans are facing it. So, I'll close with that, folks. We have a long COVID fund. Uh, we're covering the writer strike, covering a bunch of stuff. Uh, donate to paydayreport dot com. Uh, we're working with Brazil do Fato, uh, and we have a new podcast launch. And, and we share producers. We share Troy. Uh, we act radio supporting it. Uh, hopefully, we'll have this on there. So people who subscribe to the Zero Hour, subscribe to Payday Report. Donate to both, and if we keep it successful, maybe one day we'll all go to a, a good game together. Like not that not sounds the Nats. awesome. Not the Nats, <laughs> a real team. I'm not commenting on the Nats. I, I, real, I, maybe like the Orioles because they're owned by union lawyers, right? We'll go to an right. Orioles game. We'll, right. ca we'll catch the Yankees there. I'm not. I'm not giving. I'm not giving the Steinbrenners my money. Right, I hear you. I hear you. Uh, yeah. Although the Orioles and their whole stadium thing is. It, 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 that's for journalists hey. to report out there. Hey. But, but all right, man. Uh, great talking to you. And uh, right. thanks as always. Then. And to the rest of y'all, uh, this is the Zero Hour. I'm Go to paydayreport.com we'll right slash paydayreport.com. We'll see you guys okay. next month. All right. Bye. Bye.